Hello, welcome everybody. We're so pleased that all of you braved the weather to be here today. My name is Alice Jenkins, and I want to take this opportunity to suggest that as we make these coming decisions, we should keep in mind the future generations. And I know that all of you have worked together on many environmental issues in the past, so from my generation to yours, thank you. We want to offer a special thanks to Chris McConkie for his expertise and for generously agreeing to document the issue for us. Many of you are familiar with his important work through shale shock videos. And now it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Paul Connick. Dr. Connor earned his first degree at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. He earned his doctorate from Dartmouth University in New Hampshire. For 23 years, Dr. Connett was a full professor of chemistry at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. His specialty was environmental chemistry and toxicology. Ralph Nader said that Dr. Connett is the only person who can make waste interesting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Connett. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming on this uh, rather miserable day. I didn't expect very many people. I said to Pam, with this weather, you're going to be lucky to get anybody coming up. Anyway, you're here, and thank you very much. I want to start off by telling you what I was told by my Latin teacher many years ago when I was at a grammar school in England. I was 12 at the time. He said, the best definition of an educated person is someone who can entertain a friend, entertain his or herself, and entertain a new idea. Now, if you like that definition, it means that many people at university with very big degrees are not educated. <laughs> it also means that people who have never stepped into a university are highly educated if they've held on to this notion of an open mind. So hopefully you will all approach the various issues I'm going to be talking about this afternoon with an open mind. So I've been involved for 28 years fighting incineration. Started off in St. Lawrence County in 1985. And I've spent 17 years fighting fluoridation and promoting better ways of fighting tooth decay. That involvement with fluoridation ended up with this book. Uh, for those who think that this is a good idea, let me tell you, there's three scientists wrote this book, and every single argument is documented in the scientific literature. There's 80 pages of references. And the shock for me, because I thought we as scientists had done everything you'd supposed to have from a scientist. We've made the arguments transparent. We've backed them up with the scientific literature. After three years, there has been no response in writing to this book. The, the other side does not have a case that they're prepared to offer for this. Anyway, open mind again. Do look at it. Now, my waste journey has taken me to 49 states in the United States. I should make it number 50 this year because I'm finally going to Alaska. Uh, seven provinces in Canada and 60 other countries. And the United Nations in 2010, twice, January and May of 2010, the second talk I gave there was zero waste, a key stepping stone to sustainability. And this was presented to the Commission for Sustainable Development at the United Nations. And my waste journey has taken me to Italy. I can't believe this. I'd never been to Italy until 1996. I've now been there 62 times and have spoken on this issue of waste in 242 different communities. That's only, that map is only halfway through. I think that was when I'd done about 160. Uh, the two most exciting places for zero waste on this planet are Italy and California. And the first person to talk about zero waste was Leonardo da Vinci. And there's no such thing as waste, he said. Anyway, this culminated in this book. It's in Italian, written by two Italian activists, Rossano Ercolini in the center there. He won the Goldman Prize this year for his work, and Patricia Lasciotto from Sicily. She's led the zero waste campaign in Sicily and in the process stopped four incinerators being built there by the mafia. Um, and this 28-year this involvement in waste has culminated in this book. 28 years of my life is between those two covers. Please treat it gently. <laughs> and I had the great privilege of appearing in this movie uh, that was inspired and hosted by Jeremy Irons. And I was absolutely thrilled when he agreed to write the introduction 
to our, the, to our little book here because no one's heard of me in the United States, but they have heard of Jeremy Irons, so it might prompt a few more people to read it. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. A few words about sustainability, the arguments against incineration, uh, why you should let the Syracuse incinerator die a natural death and not resuscitate it here in Cortland, why the trash to ash scheme deal is bad for Cortland County, the Great Incineration Ash Scam, which we wrote about in 1985, uh, 95, sorry, uh, the Zero Waste Strategy, which is the heart of what I have to talk about, and finally, uh, Effecting Change, a few comments about Effecting Change. Broad overview, I think you're going to stop this crazy plan. I cannot believe that this will see the light of day, but that's the easy part. Uh, the, the, the more challenging part is can we make a solid waste program in Cortland County that you'll be proud of, that will generally move towards sustainable future. So it would only be a small victory for me if I hear a few weeks, a few months down the road that you stop this uh, trash for ash scheme. I'd be much more excited if you start to put in place some of the things we need to do to move towards zero waste and sustainability. So, a few words about sustainability then. Uh, we're living on this planet as if we had another one to go to. Uh, as if nature would forgive all the stupid things that we do. She doesn't give a tinky puss about us. That's what we're doing to the planet. That's uh, uh, taken from the cover of a book called The McDonaldization of Society. Sustainability, we would need four planets, at least four planets, maybe five by now, five planets if everyone consumed like an American. We would need two planets if everybody consumed like a European. And meanwhile, we have India and China copying our consumption patterns. Obviously, something has got to change. And in my view, the best place to start that change is with waste, because every single person makes waste every day. The, uh, as long as we are making waste, we're part of a non-sustainable way of living on this planet. But with good leadership, we could be part of a movement towards sustainability. I'm not saying zero waste is sustainability. There's much more we have to do, but it's a concrete stepping stone towards zero waste. So our overall task is to convert a linear society into a circular society. And at this point, if you haven't seen it, there's a lovely little video called The Story of Stuff by a close friend of mine, Annie Leonard. It's very well worth watching that uh, video. This linear society begins with the extraction of raw materials, shipping them halfway around the world, manufacturing products, consuming them, and then finally throwing them away. That's our current linear system. And as far as the impacts are concerned, we use a lot of energy in extraction, a lot of energy in transport, more energy in manufacture, more energy in transport. We produce a lot of solid waste in these two steps, 70 times more solid waste here than we see at the end over there. We produce air pollution, water pollution, carbon dioxide, elimination of species, elimination of rainforest, you name it. All maintaining this linear system. And all of this energy use, of course, contributes to global warming. So how do waste management practices affect this picture? Well, let's start with landfilling. If you bury material in a hole in the ground, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning and start all over again. It is, does not mitigate the linear society in any way in other words, this is non-sustainable. Landfills are not sustainable. By a similar token, if you burn the discarded materials, obviously you've got to go right the way back to the beginning. And again, this is not a sustainable solution. Every time you bury something, every time you burn something, every time you destroy something, you have to go back to the beginning of the linear society. Incineration is not sustainable. And in my 28 years, we've seen the transition, which coincided, I think, with the beginning of the 21st century. In the, in the 20th century, the, the preoccupation is was how do we get rid of our waste safely without causing too much damage to the environment, to our health? 
And now the, the, the question is how do we handle our discarded materials in such a way that we can share some, if not all, of these materials with the future? It's a different challenge. And in that challenge, incineration is obsolete. So here we have a dinosaur. I remember when it was built, we tried to stop it. We, we, we couldn't stop it. I remember standing in front of that incinerator and saying, you know, in Syracuse, you've got the Cathedral of Consumption at one end, the Carousel Mall, and you've got the high-tech toilet at the other end. And that's it. That's the throwaway society. Speed it up. Um, the only thing we're waiting to do is we're waiting to put the cross on the top of those shopping malls. So now let's be positive. If you recycle materials, you avoid the impact of extraction. All these impacts here are avoided if you recycle materials back to manufacturers instead of, that's right. And then if we reuse and repair the whole object, we avoid both extraction and manufacture. And similarly, with composting. Composting avoids the manufacture of some chemical fertilizers and the extraction of topsoils like peat and so on. So that too reduces a lot of these impacts. But there are other benefits of composting. It makes it puts nutrients and structure back into the soil and treats the soil as an ecosystem instead of sand that you stick plants in and then feed it chemicals. It's uh, treating nature with some kind of respect. Uh, it supports organic agriculture. It can. It helps the soil hold on to water, and it helps the soil hold on to carbon. Look at this. If you look at this as compost, see the bits of wood there? If that goes into the Syracuse incinerator, that wood is instantly converted into carbon dioxide. If, on the other hand, you compost that stuff, that, those bits of lignin and wood are retained in the soil for many months, many years. So more arguments against incineration. So the first argument is the crippling argument. It's not sustainable. Uh, it's very expensive. It creates very few jobs. Uh, most of the money leaves the community. That's all in the past now. I don't think you're contemplating building an incinerator there, so that's irrelevant. All we can say now is, we told you so. OK. Four, incineration is a waste of energy. This is relevant because Covanta is still crowing about how much energy it's producing. But far more energy is saved with recycling, reuse, and composting than burning to produce electricity. And so just reminding yourself here, when you burn this stuff over here and produce a few penny worth of energy from a, a fraction of the calorific value in the materials, what you're not getting back is the energy that's embedded in these materials and these objects. The energy of extraction, the energy of transport, the energy of manufacture. None of this is available to the burning process. But of course it is saved with that energy is saved, some of it with recycling, more of it with composting and reuse. And just to give you some idea, you know this stuff, PET plastic, 26 times more energy is saved by recycling this plastic than by burning it to produce electricity. So that's how much you save, same units. Uh, if you recycle this, that's how much you get back. If you burn it to produce electricity, that's the ratio. And even mixed plastics, you're, you're 10 times more energy is saved. And of course, you're burning a lot of plastics in Syracuse. Incineration is inflexible and stifles innovation. This is a, a statement from uh, Ludwig Kramer, on a BBC program called Panorama some time ago. He said an incinerator needs to be fed for about 20 to 30 years. The Syracuse incinerator went online, I think, in 1994. Was it permitted in 94? Anyway, around that time. So we're just coming into the 20-year mark. And in order to be economic, it needs an enormous input from quite a region. So you can see, now they want waste from Cortland to feed this monster. It stifles innovation. You stifle alternatives just in order to feed that monster which you built. 
So it's now becoming an obstruction for doing the right things. And I shall argue that Cortland should be doing a lot of really positive things, creating jobs and local businesses here in Cortland County with this material and not just settling it for it to be taken away and burnt in Syracuse. Incinerators produce toxic ash and doesn't get rid of landfills. Well, I think you know that by now since they want to use your landfill, but let's look at the numbers. For every four tons of waste burned, you get at least one ton of ash. I think in Syracuse, it's about 30% of your input ends up as ash that nobody wants. Nobody wants. No one's lining up to get this ash if you say no. So this ash, about 90% is what we call bottom ash. This falls through the grates underneath the furnace. And the fly ash is the tiny, the tiny particles which you capture uh, throughout the system in the boilers and particularly in the air pollution control equipment. And just to put this into perspective, more money is spent on a modern incinerator on this part of the, the process than the rest of the equipment put together. So they're spending an enormous amount of money to capture these toxics. The end result then is the fly ash is very toxic. And if they tell you it's not toxic, then they've got a lousy incinerator. You can't have it both ways. So, what do they do with this stuff in other countries? In Germany and Switzerland, Switzerland, they don't bother to test the fly ash. They know it's very toxic. So they put it straight into nylon bags, these big nylon bags, and they put those into salt mines. In other words, they treat it in the same way they treat low-level radioactive waste. In, in Japan, many of the incinerators vitrify the ash to make it into a glass-like material. And in Denmark, beautiful, clean, green uh, Denmark, uh, which burns a higher fraction of its waste than any other European country, sends all its ash to Norway. <laughs> in the UK, they put the fly ash into landfills. And here is a landfill near Gloucester, uh, it, between the River Severn and the, Cots uh, the Cotswolds. Is it the Cotswolds? Oh, yes. And those people in those houses are very concerned about this very toxic material blowing into their homes and into their children. But the British government said, no need to worry at all. This fly ash won't leave the facility. Trust us, we're your government. Well, the citizens did a, a very intense research program. And one of the things that they found was this road sign, this 40 miles an hour road sign, which is not inside the facility, at which point the government said, whoops, we were wrong. It does leave the facility. Well, in the United States, we have the great incinerator ash scam. And I shall talk more about that later, after I have talked about the air emissions. Incinerators put many highly toxic and persistent substances into the air. Acid gases. The big problem there is the nitrogen oxides, which when they're produced in the burning process are neutral. They cannot be removed by cheap acid scrubbers like the sulfur oxides or the HCl. And so they have to use ammonia uh, denox equipment. And that's expensive. Uh, also, more seriously, the toxic metals are elements that cannot be destroyed. So either you capture them in the ash, which makes the fly ash very toxic, or they go into the air. One of the toxic metals which is extremely difficult to remove is mercury. And I remember reading in 1991 a, an article by Janet Rayloff in Science News, where she points out the staggering information that as little as a third of a gram of mercury there's 454 grams in a pound, could contaminate a 25-acre lake to the point that the largest fish would be unfit to be eaten by a pregnant woman. Uh, the numbers are quite clear on this. Um, in 1999, the Syracuse incinerator put out 107 pounds of mercury. That's 48,000 plus grams of mercury enough to contaminate quite a few lakes. In 2009, it was down to two pounds, 
about 1,000 grams of mercury a, a, a year, still enough to contaminate a local lake. And incidentally, the only way they could get this down was to control what went into the incinerator, getting citizens to carefully return their batteries and um, fluorescent bulbs and, and so on. OK, well, what's happened here? A little more than a mile east of the Syracuse incinerator, walleye and pickerel in a tiny glacier lake in Clark Reservation State Park are swimming around with elevated levels of mercury, according to Charles Driscoll from Syracuse University. If six out of seven pickerel and two out of six walleye had mercury concentrations above the EPA guidelines for consumption. I assume this is the same concern about pregnant women. Now, the glacial lake is a glacial plunge pool, has little or no watershed, and gets virtually all its mercury from airborne sources. There is no proof that mercury in the fish has come from the incinerator. That would require air samples. This is all according to Driscoll. But Driscoll said the facility is a likely source as it is the closest discharge, air discharge, to this glacial lake. Unlike most northeastern lakes, where mercury deposits have declined since the 1980s, glacial lake sediments show rising mercury levels since the incinerator was built, Driscoll said. That's from a 2009 Syracuse Post Standard article. So that prediction that we were using, we used Janet Rayloff in the 90s, is certainly seems to have come about uh, under the special circumstances of a small lake with no uh, input from other sources. Then in addition to that, I'm sure you're familiar with this, in the burning process itself, and this is what got me involved with this issue 28 years ago, is you produce in the burning process the most toxic substances we've ever made in a chemical laboratory, namely dioxins and furans. But there are literally thousands of substances like these dioxins and furans. For example, there's uh, 132, 210 dioxin, chlorinated dioxins and furans, another 210 brominated, and then you've got another 5,000 mixed chlorinated and brominated dioxins and furans. So it's just a whole uh, incredible cornucopia of toxics produced in the burning process. Now, the major health concern as far as I'm concerned, is that dioxins accumulate in animal fat. And we estimated back in 1987, this is a paper I presented in Japan with my colleague, uh, one liter of cow's milk gives the same dose of dioxin as breathing the air next to the cows for eight months. Eight months of breathing in just a, a, a liter or quart of, of cow's milk. And this essentially was vindicated that was theoretical calculations. This was vindicated by measurements in a laboratory in Germany where they actually measured the input into cow's milk. And there they produced a staggering statistic that in one day, a cow puts into its body the same amount of dioxin that you would take 14 years to put into your body if you stood in that field for 14 years getting the same amount of dioxin as was falling on that grass for the cows to eat. So that's the first part of it. You see the tall stack, you think this dispersion, dilution. But then you've got to remember that nature concentrates. Nature concentrates mercury in fish, and nature concentrates dioxin in grazing animals, chicken, pork, eggs, and so on. Now that's the, second, that's the first part. The second part, that dioxins steadily accumulate in human body fat. And this is where our system, if you like, has let us down, or we've overwhelmed our system. Normally, the liver converts fat-soluble toxics, which is what dioxin is, a fat-soluble toxic, into a water-soluble byproduct. And if you can do that, then the kidney can get them out of the body. And if you can't do that, then these fat-soluble substances will accumulate in your body fat. And as far as the man is concerned, that accumulation will take place over a lifetime. And if you look at the levels of dioxin in your body, you will find it in a man is steadily increasing. Now, the woman can get rid of them by having a baby. So she accumulates the dioxin from her food, animal fat in particular, in the food, 
for 20 years or so, and then she has her first baby, and then in that nine months, the dioxins move from her body fat to the fetus. And then when the baby is born and she breastfeeds, she's going to give the, the baby more, more dioxin. And that's a tragedy. I remember distinctly in Germany uh, talking to a pediatrician there and who said, you know, in Germany, this is back in the 91, and she said, you know, pediatricians are recommending to, to women, pregnant women in Germany, that they only breastfeed for three or six months. I, I think it was six months. And, sh and she said, you know, the, the idea being that 90% of the benefits of breastfeeding a crew in that first six months. And then you, you hedge your bet for the rest. You, you lose 10% by not breastfeeding at that point. But she said, when you, when you start to limit breastfeeding in women, you're looking at the beginning of the end of humankind. Because you are threatening the most basic human activity there is, suckling your young. There's something very serious here. So, so I mean, what she was intimating, rather than take these draconian steps to limit a basic human function like breastfeeding, you should limit activities like incineration and making stupid things like PVC, plastic, and so on. We should get to the source of the problem. That's where we should apply our draconian approaches, not at the end of the problem when it's far too late. Now, infants, uh, dioxins interfere with fetal and infant development. Dioxins act like fat-soluble hormones. They disrupt male and female sex hormones, thyroid hormones, insulin, gastrin, and glucocorticoid. Uh, Linda Birnbaum is one of the true great heroes in the regulatory agencies in this country. Used to work for the EPA. She's now the head of the National, Environmental, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. I remember talking to Linda at a dioxin conference, and I said, because I'd just seen her confront industry who were trying to downplay dioxin, bad for animals, okay for human beings, crap, and the chlorine chemical industry, and I, she was brilliant. Every time they said something, she, she, she'd come back with five or six studies showing that they were wrong. So I said to her in the corridor, I said, Linda, I'm so glad you are where you are and you're doing what you're doing. She said, look at my back. Look at the stab wounds in my back. She was having to do this, honest science, in the face of intense industrial pressure. And if you don't know this story, it's devastating. The EPA had a, a first draft of its new risk assessment for di dioxin pre pressured from the paper industry to produce this new risk assessment. They had that ready in 1994. It was almost a finished condition. And here we are in 2014, 20, is that 20 years later? 20 years, we still don't have the final version, the cancer part of this study because of all the pressures from the industries that have an invested interest in keeping dioxin safe for human beings. Uh, the beef industry, uh, cattle industry, the paper industry, the chlorine chemical industry, the incinerator industry, all there with their pressures. And a brilliant book written by Thea Coburn and others our stolen future, all about these man-made endocrine disruptors. And the scary thing about these man-made chemicals which interfere with hormones is that hormones function at such extremely low concentrations. Hormones function, some of them are parts per trillion levels, between parts per billion and parts per trillion. So you don't need much of a chemical that interferes with hormones to have devastating effects on fetal development. So while modern incinerators have reduced dioxin emissions by a large amount, they've done a, a good job, there is no real accountability in the Canada and the United States. In other words, when you see the figures from Syracuse uh, incinerator, they look very impressive until you realize that you need three things to protect the public. You need strong regulations, you need adequate monitoring, and you need tough enforcement. And if either of these are weak, those regulations won't protect you. Look at Russia. Look at the Soviet Union. Strongest environmental regulations in the world and a terrible environment uh, decimated by pollution because they just didn't enforce 
their standards. In this case, we have to rely on the testing of dioxins once a year, maybe twice a year. But if it's once a year, you're using 18. They know it's coming. They've got about a month's notice that they're going to be monitored for dioxin. And then they pick up 18 hours of data and then extrapolate that to 8,000 hours of operation. I mean, it's a joke. And, and even they've been doing this now for many years, even though we now have from Germany uh, the AMISA system, which doesn't do continuous monitoring, but it does continuous sampling. It takes the, collects the air, the flue gas, for two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. So after a year, you've got 26 samples, and you can track the whole year's worth better than this poppycock three, six-hour test. Now we've got another kink. Another kink, that these toxic metals and the dioxins and furans, a lot of it comes out on the surface of nanoparticles. And if you think the accountability was poor for dioxins, it's even worse for nanoparticles. Nanoparticles are not monitored and they're not regulated. The standards that we use for air pollution are, at the moment, 10 microns going down to 2.5 microns. But these are like cannonballs when you're talking about these tiny particles. And there's a whole new uh, area of science which has been developed. It's called nanotoxicology. And how has that come about? Answer, because we're using nanoparticles in everything from shaving cream uh, to medicines to tennis rackets. And somebody at some point said, do they have any strange biological properties that we should know something about? And the answer came back, yes. Scary as hell. Um, we know that the 10, the 10 micron particles cause respiratory problems in about this area, and the 2.5 micron particles can get right down here and cause even more severe uh, respiratory problems. But what is interesting is that in cities, you have increased um, mortality and morbidity based upon particulate. The higher the particulate levels in your city, the higher your morbidity, the higher the mortality. And the people that have done these measurements, Doherty from Harvard and so on, have found that the smaller the particles that they measure, the stronger that relationship is. So if you do it for 2.5, you get a strong relationship. You do it for one micron, you get an even stronger relationship. Now, with nanoparticles, you're dealing with something even smaller. The first problem is they can't, you can't capture them easily with your standard air pollution control devices. They travel long distances. They remain suspended for long periods of time. They're so tiny, they move to ground with Brownian motion, not sediment and not to gravity. It's it just uh, only if it rains or you have fogs and things like that, you might clean them out. And they penetrate deep into the lungs. And here's where the story gets very frightening. Because these type particles are so tiny, there's no defense. They go straight through the membranes. They just go between the big macromolecules, the lipids and the proteins of the membrane. So that if you get them into your lungs, they're straight into the bloodstream, into the bloodstream, distributed through the whole body, and they end up in every tissue. And here is a particle in the brain. And that particle contains lead, barium, chromium, iron, silicon. Now, we've had nanoparticles in our environment for a very long time. Any high temperature combustion source, whether you're burning oil, whether you're burning wood, whether you're burning diesel, whether you're burning gasoline, is going to produce nanoparticles. The problem with incineration is that these will be the most toxic nanoparticles possible to make um, because all those toxics that we use in commerce, in products, are going to end up in the incinerator, are going to end up in nanoparticles, and potentially end up in every tissue in our body. It is scary. There's no doubt about it. It is scary. Now, there's an excellent paper written by Stefania Cormier. It was published in 2006 in Environmental Health Perspectives. And I can provide this, if there's anybody that's interested, a 30-page paper from Professor Vivian Howard has written a book on ultrafine particles. And he summarized this whole issue and presented it in a testimony against an incinerator proposed for Ireland. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I could, as I said, I can provide a PDF file of this article. If you're interested, it's very important. 
I've seen no scientific response to either Cormier's paper or Howard's statement from either the incinerator industry or government agencies promoting incineration. We are literally flying blind on this. It, 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 you know, over the next 10, 10, 20 years, we will hear about scientists tracking nanoparticles, doing elemental analysis using electron micrographs, and saying, well, this person's lung cancer was probably caused by that steel foundry or that incinerator, or the, using the fingerprint of the metals in those particles. But meanwhile, we're the guinea pigs. So, part three, why the ash for trash deal is a lousy deal for Cortland County in my view. Cortland will be swapping 23 tons of fairly benign trash, much of which can be handled in better and cheaper ways than right now, not just dumping it into a landfill, sloppy, lazy, totally irresponsible, uh, for 95,000 tons of toxic ash that nobody else wants. Are you being suckered or what? This is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. I'm sorry about the misspelling, Onondaga County does not want to put it in its own landfill. I wonder why not? Um, if it was a good economic deal, where are the communities lining up for this deal if Cortland turns it down? Do try to find out who is on the waiting list here. I, I don't think you'll find many people uh, entertaining such a deal. Tells you a lot. Now, Ash is the incinerator's Achilles heel. The better the incinerator gets at protecting the air from toxic metals and dioxins, the more toxic the ash gets. What is the ash going to do to the workers inside the incinerator? What's it doing to the truck drivers who load it in their trucks and unload it at the landfill? What's it going to do to the landfill operators? And the reason I ask this question is because the ash testing that says this is non-toxic, this ash, does not measure the actual levels in the ash, the absolute levels in the ash, but only what leaches out in a contrived leachate test. So nobody's measuring the dioxins in that ash. Nobody's actually measuring, quantifying how much lead, cadmium, mercury, etc., is in that ash. Only leachate tests. That's where the scam comes in. Now, we mentioned this is my wife put this waste not out for 13 years, and this goes back to March of 1995. This is part four of the great incinerator ash scam, which actually pertains to the Ogden Martin then, now Covanta incinerator in Syracuse. That naughty, naughty, naughty scientist from the DEC who they tried to get rid of every year because he told the truth, a uh, wildlife pathologist called Ward Stone actually went out and measured the levels of lead, cadmium, and mercury in the ash. And it was 1,400 parts per million in the Ogden Martin Syracuse incinerator, 2,650 in the Foster Wheeler incinerator, and the background levels in soil, to give you an idea, is 35 parts per million. At this point in time, the ash was going to the Montezuma landfill, uh, right next to the, the wildlife refuge, which concerned Ward Stone very much. Uh, but of course, the industry said, oh, this is non-toxic. We've done these tests. It's non-toxic. What do you mean it's non-toxic? Look at these levels here. And they tried to get Ward Stone fired for releasing these to the public. How much of the ash leachate drips from the trucks onto the road? This is wet when it comes out. The bottom ash is um, quenched in water. The leaching process is starting there. So when the trucks go out, you see any water dripping from the bottom, that's going to be lead and stuff coming out of the ash. How much of the fine ash particles are carried by the wind to adjacent fields and nearby homes and gardens uh, during unloading at the landfill? You know, you unload it, you saw the trucks in uh, England during movement at the landfill. That doesn't just get in a pile, it's moved around. And how much of the mercury, which is very volatile, that you've captured on the activated charcoal, how much of it remains there on hot days? Isn't it going to be released from the surface of the landfill on hot days? 
how much lead ends up in the surface runoff water on rainy days or when the surface snow melts. Now, I say that because when they test ash with water, in other words, when they do the leachate test, not with acid, but with water, it fails. It fails the same test if you use water, and I'll explain why. Well, if that's the case, and that's you stuff that in the landfill, and it rains on that day, that water running off the surface into the gullies or whatever is going to contain lead. Where does it go? Uh, to appreciate this last question, we need to examine the inner incineration ash scam. How the industry, with the help of government, has been able to get the ash classified as non-hazardous in the United States. Remember what they do in Germany and Japan. We allow them to mix it together and it ends up in a landfill like yours. So here's the ash scam. You ready for it? Back in 1986, David Sussman, who was then the vice president for Ogden Martin, now Covanta, said, uh, talking about ash, it means finito, morte, the end for the resource recovery industry if ash is treated as hazardous waste. There is simply no room for four million additional tons annually of ash waste. It would overwhelm all existing hazardous waste landfills. That was 1986. Look at what the industry, oh, here we go. Uh, this is a cartoon that we ran, another load of safe incinerator ash coming your way. Four different methods were used to try to get ash classified as non-hazardous to make sure the incinerator industry could remain economic, make its profits. There was a legal approach, there was a linguistic approach, there was a chemical approach, and finally they changed the test. Um, and this is in Waste Not uh, Numbers 315 to 318, March 1995. Okay. And you can get access these from our webpage, AmericanHealthStudies.org. Legal. The first thing that the incinerator industry tried to do was to argue that as, as trash was exempt from toxic testing, hazardous waste testing, the ash should also be exempt. We don't have to test trash. Ash is only processed trash. We shouldn't have to test the ash. That was the argument. This went all the way to the Supreme Court, which ruled in 1994 for that ash must be tested, and if it failed, it must go to a hazardous waste facility. Good news, but there was bad news to follow. I'll explain later. Linguistic detoxification. Um, Commissioner Jawling at the DEC argued that the ash should not be ruled toxic waste when it fails, but special waste. And this special waste would go to special waste landfills and not toxic waste landfills. Linguistic detoxification. And then we have a chemical argument. Uh, the incinerator industry argued that because the ash was going to go into separate cells in the landfill, where it wouldn't come into contact with the acid leachate generated by rotting trash, they shouldn't be testing it with acid. They should be testing it with water. And so they tested it with water. They tested the combined ash from Claremont, New Hampshire incinerator. 19 out of the 20 samples tested with water failed. So they quickly dropped that idea. So how did they, how did they get away with it? Well, they changed the test. And they changed when you did the test. The Supreme Court left it to the EPA, big mistake to determine how toxic leachate test was administered. The EPA allowed the incinerator to mix the bottom ash with the fly ash before testing. No reason, no, no practical reason for that, because the fly ash is produced over here, the bottom ash is produced over here. There is no need to mix them except for getting around this test. That's number one. Number two, the other thing that happened is the test was changed from the EP toxicity test to the TCLP test, the toxic characteristic leachate uh, process. I think, I'm not sure about the P. Uh, toxic, I've forgotten what it means, TCLP. 
But the, the big difference was in the old EP tox test, you had to add acetic acid until you got down to a pH. I think it was five, four or five. You had to get down there. In the new TCLP test, you don't have to get down there. You just have to add a specific amount of acetic acid in each test, an aliquot, a specific amount. And so how does that work? The end result is all the combined ash is now passing the toxic leachate test, this TCL test. Why? Why is that? Well, first of all, lead leaches out at high pH when it's very alkaline. And that's the fly ash has got lime in it from the lime scrubbers. It's very alkaline. So when you test that with water, it fails. The lead, the lead comes out. Then, if you get the pH down to less than 6, if you make it acidic, the lead will come out again. And that was the reason, that's when, uh, what's his face, uh, David Sussman makes this comment, because 100% of the fly ash and about 30% of the bottom ash, and I think about 50% of the combined ash, was failing this old EP tox test. Because it was forced to go down to a pH of 4 or 5. But the combined ash passes the TCLP test because only a fixed amount of acid is used and the lime in the fly ash partially, partially neutralizes the acid that you're adding, leaving the final pH around 8 to 9, which just happens to be the range at which lead is least soluble. So let me do this in pictures. This is a profile from some other source of lead leaching, this is lead leaching against pH. You'll notice that the lead leaches at high pH, alkaline. Lead leaches at acid conditions. But over here, between about pH 8 and 9, lead is the least soluble. Is there any question about the legal limit for lead? It's five, five parts per, yeah. Is that generally accepted as okay, or is that, is that sort of sound roughly too? Five parts per billion. No, I don't think, um, it's 10 times the safe drinking water standard. I think most people accept that that's fairly reasonable. Okay, so this is where the EP toxicity test left you, okay? And that failed, the, with the EP toxicity test, the, lead, uh, the ash frequently failed for, for lead. And then the, if you test with water, the lead will come out again. But this is where the, the TCLP test, the pH ends up here, and the test is, is, is passing for, for lead. And this, in fact, we got the, gathered this is the, the Environmental Defense Fund, got this data together. Here they showed the ash failing at high pH for lead, the ash failing at low pH for lead, and passing with the TCLP test here. That's the incinerator ash scan. So we thought when we got Carol Browner, the EPA would get greener, but it, we got, it got Browner instead. That was a joke. Um, and that's all documented. So why the ash for trash deal is lousy deal for Cortland County? Um, Cortland, well, I've done that already, haven't I? Yeah. Yep, I've done that. All right, I've I got this right this time on a dogger. Oh, that's what you're going to get. That is a combined ash landfill for Haverhill, Massachusetts. Huge. So don't tell me incinerators get rid of landfills. They don't. But now I'm going to change gears. I hope you've got stamina. But even if we made incineration safe and we found a safe place for the ash, we would never make incineration a sensible idea. The modern incinerator is attempting to perfect a bad idea. Our task in the 21st century is not to find better ways to destroy discarded materials. Our task in the 21st century is to stop making packaging and products that have to be destroyed. That's where the focus has to change, and that's the focus changes with the zero waste strategy. So the waste problem will not be solved with better technology, but with better organization, better education, 
a better industrial design, and these are key components of the zero waste strategy. So without further ado, here is the zero waste strategy. It's a new direction. It's, we're moving from the back end of waste management, where we've been, we've been trapped for over 100 years, to the front end of resource management, better industrial design, and post-consumerism. So we're bringing in a lot of different things here. We need three things to get to zero waste. We need industrial responsibility at the front end or upstream. We need community responsibility at the back end, downstream. And we need good political leadership to bring these two together. And I'll show you exactly where they can come together in uh, shortly. So 10 steps to zero waste. Here they are. And I think you're very familiar with many of these steps, source separation, door-to-door -door collection, composting, recycling, reuse, and repair, and, and so on. And uh, because you're so familiar with them, I, I, I'm going to give another talk here in Cortland to students uh, with a focus on sustainability. And so we'll, we'll forget about incineration next time around and focus on all these steps. Today, I'm just going to do with the last uh, steps, six through uh, ten. But first of all, I want to show you how much diversion can be achieved with these first five steps. And let me preface this by saying, back in the 1980s, I remember the solid waste guy in our county screaming down the phone at me. He said, Paul, you'll lose all your credibility if you talk about more than 15% recycling. Okay, let's run the clock forward a few years, 28 years in San Francisco, population 850,000, 50% uh, waste was diverted by 2000, 80% waste diverted by 2012 without using incineration. And their goal for 2020 is zero waste. So we have a major city committed to zero waste and many other communities in California likewise. In Italy, over 200 communities are achieving over 70% diversion, and some very quickly. Take Navarra. Navarra, in 18 months, got a 70% diversion. And Salerno, near Naples, uh, got 72%. Actually, that should be two years, not one year. Um, in Flanders, this is 6 million people. This is a Flemish-speaking part of Belgium. They're up to 73% diversion for this whole province. Of, of Belgium, Re doing everything I can think of. They even give chickens to people to, to cluck and eat the stuff in your backyard. So uh, today I'm going to focus on the residuals, on the what's left over after you've recycled, you've reused, you've composted, all the stuff that we're familiar with. Uh, how can we reduce and eventually eliminate these residuals without using destructive methods? Well, the first thing is economic incentives, e elegantly deployed. So in the three container system, one for compostables, one for recyclables, these are taken for free, but the residual fraction, the more you make, the more you pay. And the reason you've got to do that is that that's what's costing us the big bucks, uh, whether you're putting it into a landfill and incinerator or whether you're going to put it into the system I'm coming up with, that's big money. And, and uh, if you can reward people if they do the right things, but you penalize them if they do the big things. And there is a way of applying this positively. I don't want to pay any more. I'm already paying my rights and my taxes. I'm not going to pay any more taxes. All right. OK. We'll do a flat rate, a flat rate. And if you put out less than that on your curbside, less than the flat rate, you save money. You'll get a rebate in your taxes. So just be elegant about your economics. Italy, this town went from 70% diversion to 85% just introducing this pay-by-bag system. And this town in Ursabil in Basque country went from 28% to 86% diversion in seven months using this system. Why? Because they were confronted with an incinerator proposal. Waste reduction initiatives. In Ireland, the government put a 15 cent tax on plastic shopping bags. Nobody had any hope that that would do any good, but actually it reduced the use of those bags by 92% in just one year. Other countries are banning plastic bags. I've just been to Bangladesh. They just ban plastic bags. It's so delightful to go to the rural area and not see all the streams clogged up with, with plastic. 
In Italy, several supermarkets allow you to refill all kinds of bottles, uh, shampoo, detergents, water, wine, milk, and so on. This is my favorite store in the whole world, in Capanari, near Lucca, in Tuscany. Here you have 60 taps. You, uh, you go in there, you can refill your shampoo bottles, your detergents, many different flavors. Um, you can refill your olive oil, your milk, your beer, your water, your honey, and of course my favorite, the vino. You, you go over here, you get your glass of wine, and you just help yourself to this tap here. Very nice. And there's a, there's a map in the back telling you where the wine is produced. You try your second one. My favorite place in the whole of this. And no plastic. If you don't have your own shopping bag, then you can buy one made of jute or cotton. And in the schools, the primary schools, they've taken out all the plastic, replaced it with stainless steel, china, and, and metals. Stainless steel, ceramics, and glass. We need to do that in every school, in every institution in Cortland County. Make that a top priority. And babies. We want zero waste babies. Uh, your reusable diapers, not disposable diapers. Echo bimbi. And so, so at this point, then, we've done everything that we can. Reuse, repair, recycling, composting. Um, waste reduction initiatives, pay by bag system, but we've still got residual fraction. We can get up to 80%, 85% in smaller communities in Italy. One community in Italy is up to 93%. Um, we can do a lot, but we're going to still have the residuals. And so step eight, in my view, is the most important step, and it's waiting for Cortland County. You can do this. You've got your own landfill, and you can do what Nova Scotia has done with their landfills. This is the most important step to get close to zero waste. I think many of you would be happy with 80%, right? But people, no, Dr. Connie, you talk about zero waste. How are we going to get to zero waste? Come on, tell us how many going to. Here's how you do it. All right? Step eight makes the residual fraction very visible. Incineration attempts to make it disappear. There, step eight is a residual separation and zero waste research facility. We've got the first part of this operating in Nova Scotia. These facilities are built at the entrance of the landfill. No material can enter the landfill without being separated and screened. More material can be recycled. More toxics can be removed and identified. And the dirty organics are biologically stabilized above ground before they cause damage underground. So the, that's the first part. So it's operating in Nova Scotia. Here it is. This is the Otter Lake. There's Otter Lake. This is the Otter Lake landfill. There's a residual screening facility. The trucks cannot come directly into the landfill. They've got to go through this facility. Uh, there's a close-up. And here you see the residual fraction coming in in plastic bags. Those are loaded onto conveyor belts. The bags are opened. The materials are not crushed. It's a gentle system onto conveyor belts, more recyclables, more toxics. Here you see the well-protected workers. Um, uh, you can see his ears are protected, his breathing is protected, his eyes are protected, his head is protected, and he has gloves on as he's handling these uh, residual fractions. The dirty organic fraction is not touched. That makes its all its way to the end of conveyor belt, where it is then shredded. So here's the shredder. This is going to now cut this up into tiny pieces. And that's going to be dumped into these long concrete troughs. And along the railings on the top of those troughs is this, this thing which turns it, aerates it, and shifts it a few feet each day. And after the end of 18 days, it's been shifted from one end to the other. This is the composting operation that goes on for 18 days and uh, it, this is eventually ends up in the landfill. Uh, I think it may be used as landfill cover. So I've done a whole videotape on this and you can watch it. All the steps that they're doing in Nova Scotia. It was the first province in Canada to get 50% diversion from, from landfill. And that's amazing because Nova Scotia was not perceived as an environmentally advanced uh, province. Now we need to add to this system a zero waste research center. We need to slap it, this in here to study the non-recyclable 
uh, fraction. And, and we need to recruit our professors and students who are interested in sustainability from our local universities and technical colleges. If you're interested in sustainability, it isn't just theory, get your hands dirty. Have a look at it. These are our failures. These are our industrial design failures. We won't change it until we study our failures. So we need to improve, the, we can do a lot of things at this research center. We need to improve the capture rate of the stuff we can handle. We need to recommend to local businesses and institutions waste avoided strategies. We need to develop local uses for some materials. You can use shredded newspaper for cattle bedding, for insulation, et cetera. Um, recommend better industrial designs to industry on packaging and products and link with other aspects of sustainability. That's why we need our brightest people involved because we want them to use this as a starting point to th start thinking of how we can link this to other aspects of sustainable. Sustainable architecture, sustainable agriculture, sustainable uh, industries, sustainable communities, sustainable economies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what is beautiful here is that nature makes no waste. Why does nature make no waste? Answer, because she has feedback mechanisms. If inside your body you produce a metabolite which you can't use, usually that metabolite will switch off the process, the first enzyme responsible for making it. It's a feedback mechanism. And we have a waste problem in Western society because we don't apply feedback mechanisms. We hide the stuff in landfills or burn it in incinerators and divert people's attention uh, with all that bad design which is going up in smoke. We have a waste problem because we have not used feedback mechanisms. If we don't like something, we just simply burn it or bury it. Um, we need the Zero Waste Research Center to monitor the local system and to bring the issue back to the front end of industrial design. Here, we've, we started some small zero waste research centers in Italy, and they're already achieving success with what they're finding, including these dreadful coffee cap capsules. Each, each time you have a cup of coffee in Italy, you get one of these bloody cups capsules, which nobody can use. So they're writing to the company, negotiating with the company to try to find some alternative methods of single serving coffee. This, is, this zero waste research center is where community responsibility meets industrial responsibility with this message, the message to industry, if we can't reuse it, if we can't recycle it or compost it, then industry shouldn't be making it. That's the message that we've got to deliver. It will go off like a damp squib, we said in England. It will go off with a, like a suet pudding unless the community that's saving this has really got up there. You can say this to industry when you're up to 70, when you're up to 80, but you can't say it if you're only up to 15% diversion. We need better industrial design for the 21st century. This brings us to the fourth R. You know the, the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. We, we include compost in that. The fourth R is redesign. So community responsibility is to take all that stuff we're consuming, reduce it, reuse it, recycle and compost it. And industry is to redesign, redesign the products here that we can't do that to. Better industrial design then is step nine. A step 10 is this interim, interim landfill biologically for the biologically stabilized dirty organic fraction. Remember, this is what it looks like. And uh, yes, so here's the summary of those 10 steps again. And what I like about this, these 10 steps, is it begins with everybody. Everybody's involved at the beginning with these 10 things. Either you mix it, you're part of the problem, or you separate and you're part of the solution. So everybody is there from the beginning with our children, our teams, everybody. But by the time we get down to steps nine and 10, we are drawing upon the brightest minds in our society. We're drawing on our professors, our students, and our industrial designers. And I think it's preposterous that we're approaching sustainability, which after war is the biggest problem that we've faced since the Industrial Revolution, how we move to a sustainable society. 
And the, to think that we would do it without drawing upon the mainstream of universities, not just the environmentalists, not just the scientists, but everybody at university should be struggling with how the hell we pull off this transition from 300 years of throwaway society to a sustainable society. It's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be damn, damn difficult. But it was certainly going to be more difficult if we just leave, leave this to environmentalists and activists. It's got to be our brightest minds. Whew. Amen. Amen. Yes, brother. Yes. And the church, too. Let's have them as well. Um, this plan is better for the economy, more jobs. There are more jobs in reuse, particularly reuse and repair, job training. Oh, my God. Um, it's better for our health, less toxics. It's better for our universities, more meaning, more relevance. It's better for the planet. It's more sustainable. And it's better for our children. Because... It offers more hope. I mean, right now, what are you offering your children in Cortland County? You're using up their resources because you're not recycling, reusing, or composting to any significant extent. So you're reusing up your kids' and your grandkids' resources. Uh, OK, you can blame your local council, but you've still got to look at yourself. Why aren't you raging to them to get the right, doing the right thing? And then what are you doing? Now you're proposing to leave them a toxic legacy. So two legacies. One, you're using up their resources. And two, you're going to swap this for toxic ash. What an insult to the future that is. But more importantly, what are we doing to young people now? Every day on television, what are they learning? They're learning about global warming, ozone damage, the loss of rainforest, the loss of species. They're learning about the plastic, which is ending up in the Pacific. Seven times more plastic pieces in the middle of the Pacific than plankton. They're, they're, they're learning that there's toxics in our babies when they're born. What are we saying to our kids? We're saying there is no future for you. Every day, there's no future for you. And if our kids don't have some kind of hope, if we can't offer them some kind of plan, some kind of agenda, then they lose hope. It, this society of ours will become more cynical, more hedonistic. And yes, isn't it good that we're legalizing marijuana? Because we're going to need it. <laughs> A few words about affecting change. Uh, affecting change is like driving a nail through a piece of wood. The expert can sharpen the nail. And that's what I've tried to do today. I've, try, I've tried to sharpen quite a few nails. It's probably been a bit overwhelming. Right? But uh, for those who want it, this PowerPoint is available to you. And I'm sure through Chris here, this videotape will also be available to you as, as a tool. But the thing about the experts is they can't push the nail through the piece of wood. I don't think I have ever gone solo into a council and persuaded them to adopt zero waste. You just can't do it. It's not information. It's, you need the hammer. You need the hammer of public opinion to drive that nail home. So hopefully I've given you some ammunition. But you're the ones who can do this. You are the ones who can stop this stupid ash for trash uh, uh, tr um, scheme, and more importantly, hopefully you can get a zero waste program in Cortland County. And if you really want to satisfy me, get me a residual screening and zero waste facility in front of your existing landfill. And by the way, please tell your councillors, there may be some here I don't know, please tell your councillors, that landfill is your capital. Don't treat it as income. It's capital, and spend it as slowly as you can. So anything that you can divert the waste away from that landfill um, is money in the future's hands. So three final messages for you to citizens. Don't let the experts take your common sense away. A lot of what I've said this afternoon is common sense. To the politicians, put your faith back in people. Stop running to consultants and magic machines. Go to the people. We won't let you down. We really will not let you down. 
Look at Italy, look at California. The people did not lead, the, let down the politicians. Once they have vision, once they have determination, the people will be for them. The people are hungry for this kind of leadership. And finally, to activists, really important, because your biggest battle, Pam, is not to burn out. So you have to share the load, and as you share the load, you have to have fun. You gotta celebrate often, party often. Whatever slight victory you think you've won, you celebrate. You celebrate in every way you can. You gotta enjoy this. And, and I know you can enjoy this because I'm a very privileged person. I told you about 60 different countries. When I speak, in 60 different countries, and it makes no difference whether it's South Korea, Australia, Japan, Argentina, it doesn't make any difference. The people in this audience that come to my talks are there not to make money, not to get power. They're there because they're concerned about their children, their grandchildren, their community, and their planet. You're dealing with the best people in the world. And I guarantee if you take this seriously and fight it, some of the people in this room will end up that you don't know right now are going to be your best friends. This is what happens all the time. Have fun. Enjoy this. I remember right at the beginning, I said to my wife, I said, when this is over, this is over, I said, I'm going to paint the kitchen. <laughs> A few months, maybe years later, I realized I wasn't going to finish the kitchen. A few years after that, I realized it would never be over. And a few years after that, my kids grew up and they painted the kitchen. So <laughs> it, it, this isn't going to be over. This battle for sustainability is for the rest of our lives, whether we like it or not. So have fun. Enjoy it. Enjoy the battle. Make them miserable. <laughs>